Okay, uh, uh, thanks everybody for coming to this talk and for, for the organizers for letting me present here. Um, so my name is uh, Patrick Law. Uh, I, I realize that uh, I don't know a great deal of people, many people here, so I have two slides that's about the kind of things that I've done in, recently uh, and, and relevant to today's talk. So my background is as a software engineer and a mathematician at uh, UQ, so I was at the uh, School of Math and Physics over there. And uh, my PhD actually was half at UQ and at Orvis University over in the math department uh, with Sir Nasmussen as the advisor. And then after some time in Lyon, I ended up at University of Melbourne where this work was done. And it was and a second postdoc, but uh, effectively, I thought I think of it as a research software engineering role because I was sitting there as writing code all day during the lockdowns. Um, and um, now I'm here in Sydney, which is an improvement, and uh, I'm at UNSW Actuarial Science Lecturer. Uh, in the, along the way, I, I wrote this uh, short book with two co-authors on Hooke's processes. So if you see a little <coughs> graph on the left which popped up in yesterday's talk, that's, uh, that's where it came from. Uh, other two unrelated uh, things that uh, might be of interest here, I have a, a Python package for approximate Bayesian com computation. Uh, so I don't know how many people uh, are Python users here, but I'm very proud of all these animations I made to um, explain what is ABC uh, using just a coin flip example on, on that website. And more recently this year, I developed a whole new course, Deep Learning for Actuaries. Uh, so I think a few different neural network topics have been uh, popping up recently. So it, that's open source and online of, of interest to anyone. Okay, on to today's talk. So uh, uh, today's talk is uh, the goal that I have for it is for to take a pair of time series. So here I've got daily measurements in Chicago of temperature and uh, the, the number of crimes. And uh, just to say, throw it into some software package and say, what causes what? Is there one causing the other in here? And so here, our goal is to have something like, okay, um, no evidence that crime causes temperature. It's, you wouldn't expect it, the causation to go in that direction. But there's some evidence maybe of a link in the other way from temperature having an effect on the crime. So most of this talk is presenting this paper, this, this data journal paper uh, with lo lots of co-authors, Jin Jing, uh, Michael, who's now at the business school at, at UQ, and George Su Sukihara, who I, I think is probably retired in his mansion somewhere in America. Uh, and myself, and, and thanks to ARC for funding uh, that discovery project. Uh, so our view of causality in this in this world is to imagine that our data generating process is a, um, uh, a nonlinear dynamical system. Now, so here I've just got x, y, and z, but for the time series, but uh, pretend that's something of interest to your field. It, maybe it's the GDP and unemployment or something or other, or maybe it's the number of fishes and sharks in, in your ecosystem. And imagine that we're God and we could see the data generating process and it's this set of equations. The exact equations don't really matter. But if we could see these equations, we'd agree that, uh, say, Y is a direct cause of X and, and uh, X and Z are direct causes of Y um, because the, the, at the next time step, uh, we can see the rely on, the, on those values at the current time. So that's the kind of causality uh, we're talking about here. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the time, our systems have lots of dimensions, and we only observe a, a, a few of them. We don't observe the whole system, uh, which is where uh, uh, Tarkin's theorem comes into play, um, which I have a, a demo or two about. So imagine these, these are this uh, x, y, and z that I just showed you, uh, and uh, they're just plotted as three different time series here. I'll change the parameter to make it more chaotic, more interesting. Now, instead of three different time series, uh, pretend that we just view it in three-dimensional space, so uh, point moving around in phase space. Uh, so that's uh, uh, the way we'll view it. That, those equations, of course, uh, I chose the Lorenz attractor to make it nice and pretty. Uh, and that's a chaotic system. So uh, starting you know, the, at slightly different locations, you end up at totally different points. Uh, that's, what, uh, that's beside the point. Now, what the main part of Tarkin's theorem is to uh, take, uh, imagine we only see the exits here. We've got X, Y, and Z as the whole system, but we only observe one of them. Uh, we want to reconstruct the whole system just from that one, 
one time series. So here I've got x, y, sorry, just x, and I view it at, say, times 25, uh, 35, and 45, and I generate three new time series from that, well, sort of uh, recycling the one time series in, into three time series. Uh, and as I move along um, the time, it's kind of like moving a comb along the time series of the original one to generate um, three new time series. I found this on the web. Oh, gosh. Well, thanks, Siri. <laughs> um, now, what we've done is we've we sort of reconstructed uh, three dimensional, three time series from the one, uh, which is what the system was made in. And if we plot that, in the three-dimensional phase space, instead of x, y, z, we have x and the lags of x, lag once, lag twice, uh, we get this picture, which isn't, uh, which isn't the uh, butterfly attractor, but it's pretty close. And in fact, that's what Tarkin's theorem tells us. If you do this, this thing called the shadow manifold uh, is a diffeomorphism of the original full manifold. So there's a relationship there. We could stretch this this thing to become just like the original full system, which is kind of magical, right? We only see one small fraction of this complicated nonlinear system, and, and that's all we need. Uh, so just for example, I, I, I plotted the two of them side by side, the, um, the original butterfly tractor and the reconstruction. And then you could do the same thing for a different variable here, y. The, re the shadow manifold, the reconstruction looks pretty similar. And there's a correspondence between the, the points in each of these manifolds uh, and the, the reconstructed points, the shadow manifolds. And that's what the, um, that's what the, the core of EDM is, is, is uh, relying on. OK, so creating lag embedding. So the example I'm using for this talk is this uh, crime and temperature uh, one. So I'm using that again here, creating lagged embeddings. Um, take uh, take one of them, say we've got temperature here, and I'm creating these little, um, that the EDM people call them points on the manifold, but I kind of think of them as like short little mini trajectories in, in the uh, time series. And uh, the, so the temperature at some time and the previous time and a few times back, uh, capital E, number of them. And I'll throw that into a vector x, and, and the target that we want to, that's associated with that is the other time series, so crime at the same time, T. And then to do prediction, uh, we, well, to do any of these EDM methods, we split up kind of like a train test split in, in the machine learning world, uh, but it's, uh, it's not, ex it, it's, it's uh, akin to that, but I, uh, I agree with them that not, uh, they use the terminology library and prediction sets. And it, they, because they're, they're used in a slightly different way to train and test sets, so I've, I've um, come to terms with the fact that it's not the same terminology. Uh, but basically, we train on the, the, the library set. And for points in the prediction set, uh, we have the x sort of covariates. And uh, we pretend we don't have the y, which is the thing we're trying to, to predict. Uh, and with that, uh, that point, let's say we pick one point we're trying to predict, uh, we compare it to all the points in the library set and calculate the distance between them. So Euclidean distance or any other distance like that. Uh, so that's already very computationally demanding. And a, a, a non-parametric way to predict uh, uh, this, where this point, the y associated with this point is, is to find the, the nearest neighbors uh, in the library set uh, and see this example I've just chosen two, two nearest neighbors and I'm pretending that uh, x3 and x5 are the closest ones to the point xs that I pulled out of the prediction set. Uh, and then one basic uh, EDM method to predict is the simplex method. You, you basically see, uh, if these are the neighbors, you see what the values of y for, for that time step for 3 and 5 and do a weighted average of them. Uh, the slightly more complicated one is uh, the S map, where they take a... Um, they, they do a, a, a linear approximation at each different point, but it's not the same linear approximation. They, they weight the points that are closer to the point you're trying to predict higher to, than the ones further away in the library set. Uh, so this is all kind of um, oh, uh, details I need to move quickly. So these are ways that you make predictions of the y's, but we in fact have the y's, the true values of the y's. So we can make a lot of these predictions, y hats, 
compare it to the. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, compare the true values to the prediction, so we can see how well our predictions are doing, and, and calculate the correlation coefficient there. Uh, so now we get to the back to the causation. The, uh, uh, the, the core idea of, of, say, in this example, temperature and crime is, uh, if temperature actually had a causal effect on crime, then temperature, some information about in temperature gets embedded in the time series about the crime. And now, if I flip that around, that means if I have crime, I should be able to predict temperature a little bit, if that's, if that's actually the case. And in fact, if you, uh, if you have more and more observations of the crime, you should be able to see better and better forecasts of the temperature. That's sort of the core idea of this convergent cross-mapping. So if you want to see how this, uh, an example of this, we have it in the paper, we have it in, and, and this is how it looks like in, in R, for example, the, the time series themselves plotting crime and temperature. Uh, they, they correlation coefficients like 0.46, but it's, you couldn't tell causation or the direction from, from just looking at correlations. And you eventually get these kind of plots, which are looking at um, uh, how well your predictions go on the y-axis and the x-axis, given more and more training data. Uh, to work on. Um, okay, and uh, getting to the fun part, which is the uh, the software related to this. So my job was to um, make this data package uh, when I was over in Melbourne, uh, and uh, this it's very good, I have to say. Uh, it, it has lots of different features. It's very fast. It's uh, running C++ in the background, multi-threaded. Um, it can handle all kinds of data, panel data, missing data, uh, and uh, factor variables, various distances, and even we we had uh, some developers in America help us make it GPU accelerated as well, so it should should be even faster. And I and I made this website, the documentation page, put a lot of effort into it, to having all these sliders where you can see all the hyperparameters, what happens if you play with them. Uh, the, the the matrices change in different ways, so you can interact with the with the all the various options that we built in. Uh, but uh, SATA itself is something that I think is total garbage, and I never want to use it ever again. <laughs> and uh, I don't actually want to pay for it either. Yeah. And so now that I've uh, moved on, I, I'm trying to port this to R and, and Python. Uh, and so that's relatively <laughs> relatively easy to do because. We wrote the C++ in a way that you can put it anywhere. It's kind of like a virus in that way. Um, <laughs> and um, and uh, we, so the basic uh, parts are there, but now I'm trying to add on top of that, uh, make it more uh, ac accessible, make automate the analysis. That's what I showed you at the beginning. Easy EDM, that's what we're working on now uh, to automate this process. Uh, and uh, as I said as well, there's also uh, this Python package. Oh, I should have pointed out. So right now, I've got the help of a uh, research assistant at, at UNSW, a student, Rishi. He's done lots of good work on this automation right now. Uh, so the, well, in terms of just one slide on the engineering side, because I spent so much time on that, it's, it's open source code, and there's lots of it, nearly 10,000 lines of code. Uh, it's available on an MIT license, so anyone can use it for anything, even making a lot of money. Um, it's well tested, so another 5,000 lines of code for unit tests and integration tests. Another 5,000 <coughs> lines of code for the documentation and the websites, doc documentation websites. It's all run in Git and, and in GitHub Actions, so that means uh, if I change one line of uh, C++ code and put it into <coughs> GitHub, it'll automatically spin up something like 30 different computers on the, the Microsoft Azure cloud test it on, test the new code, compile it, and test it on uh, Linux, uh, Windows, Mac, you know, test it on Python, different versions of Python, different versions of R, uh, and even put it through Stata. And uh, uh, yes, and the code, as I said, works everywhere, even, oh, I should have mentioned, uh, even in WebAssembly, which is, <coughs> so I've got this uh, rough demo here, the Python package, and if you know what Shiny is, a Shiny website where you, you go to the website and you, you can play toggle play with um, toggles and it sends the requests off to some server in the background, it does the work that you're paying for that server and it sends the results back to the user. 
uh, well, this is using this thing called PyScript in WebAssembly. It's, this is similar to that, but better, because what, what it's doing is it compiles the C++ into this very performant code that runs on the user's computer. So you don't need to pay for a server um, to keep running forever. Another reason why Python's superior to R. Um, but and in the near future, uh, I'm hoping to be able to build this up. This is just this this rough page here is just a proof of concept of that EDM code running locally on on the through the browser. So hopefully we'll be able to just have a user drag their data set onto a website. They don't need to install anything. It'll just do a whole bunch of automated causal analysis uh, and uh, be done. Five minutes left. Actually, don't think I have five minutes things to say, but I can, my final slide is uh, just, I was hoping that uh, this audience would be a good, a good one to, to uh, advertise all this work to, because it's 20,000 lines of code at the end of the day, and I hope people use it, <laughs> and, um, and I'd like some feedback as well, I, I mean, I don't use R or Stata particularly, so I'd, if things seem a bit counterintuitive there, I'd like to know um, about it. On t uh, even better than that is if you're talented in causal inference or programming in any of these languages, Stata and JavaScript and whatnot. Uh, we'd love contributors, of course. Uh, and um, my boss at UNSW sent me this message that uh, we're also looking for PhD student applicants in the next week if they're very good. So <laughs> thought I'd sneak that in. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs> Say a few words about how do you design this architecture that you write C plus plus code to you know fit into packages in R, Python, etc. Can I speak about how I how we did this? Uh, yeah, just a few words. Yeah, the well, the the, the gen genesis of this was a uh, uh, Jin Jing in, in Canberra. I wrote a Stata package just in Stata. He started moving it inside of Stata. There's another language called Meta, which is slightly faster but still garbage. <laughs> and um, so we, were moved, we decided to move that over into C++ to make it faster. But due to the, um, it was actually quite hard because Stata has very limited support for this. So we, we had to do lots of things from scratch ourselves. I, I, I had to organize our own um, code to run the different threads, for example, which is something you'd normally just import a library to. And we couldn't do that. And because of that, all that hard work, it made it really easy to then use in those other like languages, R, you can just call into it with R CPP. Made it, that, it was pretty much work first go, which was a surprise. And in Python, there's a similar thing called pipeline 11. Yeah. Could I ask you um, what we learn about causal inference? Because when we see the word inference, inference means not just knowing something, not even just having a point estimate, but having a measure of uncertainty about what we've learnt. So mm. you don't seem to have models and parameters that we estimate and glean information from. So what are you mm. doing that is useful for people who want to know not just what's causing what what else, but by how much and how confident we can be about that number? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I would say there's a, a few ways to look at that. Uh, because we're we're not having a, a model for the for the, the data generating process. It makes it actually quite generically a, a applicable. Um, maybe we don't learn so much as you do. If we were fitting a model, we wouldn't be able to interpret all the different coefficients and whatnot. Uh, but I have seen it used in these situations where here I just talked about two time series, but maybe you had thousands and you didn't know what caused what. You could do all combinations of this and then try to see, okay, these two things might be related. Let's look into that further. Um, okay. But that's what you need inference because you could just be getting that by chance. Yeah. Well, there is some sense of uh, uh, how good are, are your predictions um, from from the output of here, and it, this is why right now the work we're doing to automate this process is actually really hard because it's hard to. Um, totally automate the human judgment that would take to look at these kind of diagrams to say, is that a strong effect or a kind of a weak effect? Um, yeah, so that's work in progress, and I'd love some help with that, actually. <laughs> oh, Gail, you know, she's, <laughs> she's got a lot of time on her hands these days. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you'd stop her asking questions like that if she had a real project, yeah. <laughs> 
All right, let's yeah. thank Patrick. Yeah. yeah. yeah.